Welcome to Android Dialogues, where we have bite-sized conversations with people in the Android community. I'm Huyen Dow, and I'm speaking with... Kelly Schuster. And today we are actually in downtown Denver. Uh, thank you much, very much, Tech Mobile, for letting us borrow your office. Kelly, how did you get started in Android, and where are you based? Uh, so I'm based here in Denver, Colorado, and I work for ThoughtBot. And I got started in Android three years ago. Um, I used to be uh, in electrical engineering, and I did firmware. Um, but awesome. I really missed sort of the like, human interaction at the end, you mm -hmm. know? And so, um, you know, because my firmware, it's, it, it's in the end point, it's acting with, or like reacting with, you know, other circuits and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I thought it was so cool that with mobile, you could like have hardware device like in somebody's hand that you could have access to and play with cool hardware. But um, there was also like a, a component of like user experience, like with a, a human at the end. And so I wanted to get involved in that. So oh, yeah, awesome. so that's how I got started in Android. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. Cause like, I love talking to folks. So I, I come from a computer engineering background. So I always love talking to folks that work in computer engineering or in embedded systems like Kelly uh, did. And you know, I, I think one of the reasons that I, I like uh, talking to people like from kind of more circuity backgrounds is that I think that when, depending on what your background is, right? So everyone, we have a huge community. People come from different places, from web, from Java server, from kind of circuity type areas mm -hmm. of engineering and embedded systems. And it really feels like that where you come from kind of paints how you view things. Um, and and I really feel like that's true with mobile because, you know, we when we work on mobile, you know, I think it feels like there's like a hierarchy that there's like, you know, circuits and then embedded systems and then your mobile device and then you have like your desktop and then like an actual server in terms of like resources and and oh, yeah. and so like you you kind of have to code to where you are and so I guess my question for you <laughs> is how do you think that your history in embedded systems and working on firmware how do you feel like that affects your thinking as a mobile developer and what are lessons that you think are good lessons that you brought with you sure sure so yeah, it definitely, as you said, it really colors the way that you think about Android a lot, like kind of how you approached it, um, where you, what you were doing before uh, mobile development. Um, so like when I was in firmware, we were writing in C, and there was a lot, uh, like obviously a huge focus on, um, you know, clock cycles and memory management, you know, to the point where like every data structure we use, every value we used, we defined like, literally how many bits will this be, you know? <laughs> right. Like, there were no, like, libraries that were used. There were no, like, fancy data structures. You know, it was down to the bit, you know? And, like, special rules about for loops. Like, you're working with a 32-bit system, so, like, always do your for loop counter as 32 bits, even if you would only fit in an 8-bit number, because every time it does the math for the loop, it has to sign extend it to 32 bits, and then you'd waste, like, an extra cycle. So, like, really intense stuff. And so I... We spend a lot of time like reinventing the wheel because you can't afford like the extra baggage of bringing in some other library or data structure. Mm -hmm. So when I came to Android, I spent a lot of time like reinventing the wheel and stuff. And I viewed my embedded background almost as like a liability because mm -hmm. I would spend a lot of time like doing things and people would come over and be like, you know, there's a method in Java for that, Kelly, you know, like you can just use this other data structure. And so I spent a lot of time trying to kind of like remove myself from this embedded way of thinking and oh, put myself more in this like Java way of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, but then, recently, actually, I went to a talk in DroidCon London by Chet Haas, and it was uh, Android for Java developers, which I wasn't initially a Java developer, but he's awesome, and I figured that I could learn a lot from his talk. Um, so I went, and I kind of had this like epiphany, like, oh, maybe this isn't totally a liability, because there are a lot of things that people coming from like a server-side Java background are going to end up doing um, that actually like a lot of times the data structures people were telling me just use this it's easier mm -hmm. actually was like a huge hit in terms of memory you right know? yeah or like yeah. taking advantage of like he has this great example of the the for each loop instead yeah. of like a traditional yeah. for loop mm -hmm. that like if you're using unless you're using a regular old array if you're using any of the other data structures it'll it'll if it's an empty structure it'll still do like one clock cycle where it tries to figure out like and it doesn't realize the data structure is empty. Right, yeah. So you could potentially waste a lot of time doing that. And so that kind of like brought me back to realize like, oh, this is actually cool. Like thinking about these data structures is actually really important for, for Android because it is a really small memory constrained device. And like mm -hmm. 
like, I don't know, it's just, it's good to like have a happy medium, you know, like yeah, think about yeah. what you're pulling in before you pull it in. Yeah, like, definitely. And, and we talk so much in our community about high level architecture, right? Mm -hmm. So we have these discussions on MVP and MVVM and all that. And, th and those are important discussions, but at the same time, we're not like, it, we, we can't ignore that stuff. And, exactly. and I think we talked about earlier, you know, like, and, and you guys have probably heard about perf matters and stuff. And, yes. and you know, it's, it's definitely never one or the other. It's like, well, it's important to have clean architecture and a good, good abstractions, but it's it's also important to pay attention to the low level exactly. like, performance type stuff. So other than being totally awesome for, you know, uh, knowing all about like how many bits that you would need. <laughs> uh, Kelly also is a badass in terms of community and we talk about community a lot on our channel and Kelly is actually the director of Women Who Code uh, in Denver. Uh, so Kelly, can you tell us a little bit about what Women Who Code is and, and what you do? Yeah, sure. So I'm the director for Women Who Code Denver and basically we exist to help women um, have a sense of community in the tech industry because um, there's kind of a lot of dudes in the tech industry, which is fine, but <laughs> it's good to hang out with other ladies too. Um, and so we offer a lot of uh, technical talks. Um, and so we're not just for Android, we're like across all platforms. Um, so we have technical talks on everything from, you know, back end Ruby on Rails development to Python scripting to Android and iOS and front end web. And all the things. All the, literally <laughs> all the things, yeah. <laughs> So we uh, host a tech talk once a month in Denver. We usually have a, a galvanized plat. Um, okay. And uh, yeah, we have people come in. We also do uh, workshops. So um, I do a, a workshop with Judy Chan. She does a, like an intermediate level Android workshop where we get together and work on our own projects and like give each other feedback and do code reviews and stuff like that. Um, so it's basically just a place for women to come and hang out and learn tech, network, um, and you know just level up on their skills. Nice. And and women who code is in a lot of different cities. Oh right? yeah, that's right. Yeah, so it's not just in Denver; it's all over the globe, um, and they have their like new networks are starting up all over. So like, if you are interested in starting up a network in your home city, um, you can go to the womenwhocode.com website, and they can give you the resources to start one up. It's a really cool way to meet new people, and um, it's pretty awesome. I, I I love talking to Kelly. Kelly's done so many <laughs> fabulous things. She's also very newly minted a GD. Yes. So congratulations on that. Thank you. And if you live in Denver, you might read the Denver Post and you might have actually seen Kelly uh, on the Denver Post <laughs> related actually to her work in Android because you actually did some work on accessibility. Mm -hmm. And accessibility is something that, you know, we've talked about on our channel before with Haley Smith and just something that we all kind of do as part of our Android work, or at least you should. <laughs> but for me, I always feel like accessibility is kind of an abstract something that it's something that I know is good for me to do but as far as I know you know I I just know that I should put content descriptions on things I know that I should test my app and talk back to make sure that you know it sounds like it's doing the right thing and you know I should maybe like test for colorblindness but you actually had a really concrete experience working with accessibility uh, can you tell us a little bit about that yeah sure so with my work at iTriage I worked with the Blind Institute of Technology which um, they're basically QA testers um, that also happen to be blind and they uh, really taught me a lot of sort of like the practical application of accessibility because you're right it does seem sort of like really abstract um, when you're just kind of reading through the docs and so it was really good to get their feedback as far as like what what should I be doing you know so like content descriptions on images image buttons are super important especially if they're con like a contextual type of thing so if you think of like a play button that like turns into a pause button there's usually not like like on Pandora or something you know yeah, like as a yeah. media player like there's not like separate buttons so you'd want to make sure also that like your content description is dynamic oh yeah you know? otherwise you don't want to just set like play and then no matter what they hit it would continue to just read out play you want oh, to make right. sure that you're yeah. dynamically changing yeah. the content description um, another good one to remember is like the floating action button so material design is like all the new hotness, you know, everyone knows this by now. I'm so sure. hot right now. Yes, oh my god, material. Um, so, <laughs> so the problem though is like if you have like a list that's underneath a floating action button, the way that you access through accessibility, it like reads out one element at a time. When you reach the bottom of the list, it'll like load the rest of the list. So lists can get pretty long, especially like if you're thinking about Gmail or inbox. Like right, yeah. We all have like millions of emails. Like you'll never access the floating action button. So like a practical, because it'll be read at the very bottom of the list mm -hmm. after oh, you finish going really through point. it. Wow. 
So one thing you can do, you know, is set the accessibility traversal order of your floating action button to be read after the toolbar. Oh, cool. Yeah, so it's like now, as a blind user, it's like this is the prominent action, or, or as someone using like a trackpad or like a head switch, it's the prominent action, that's why it's the floating action button. I can access it right away. I don't have to like get lost in trying to like scroll through my entire list. So those are some, like, especially with material, there are a lot of little things like that, that like, again, like that's a one-liner, like set accessibility traversal order in the XML, so it's like, you know, pretty pretty simple. Just like start going through your app with TalkBack turned on, and you'll mm -hmm. start to notice these funny little things where you're like, wow, that's actually really hard to get there. You know, like how how could I make this easier to navigate through TalkBack or some other service? Oh, that's really, I, wow, I never really thought about it that way. No, because I mean, you kind of usually feel like, okay, I put content description on, on, on everything, and they're, they're pretty decent descriptions, but I never thought, it's, and, you, and you're right, because mobile apps are so inherently visual, yeah. like how does that translate, especially with all of our, you know, motion design and everything with yeah. how does that translate? That's really, oh man, <laughs> no, that's, I, I mean like, cause I think that's really, and like you said, it's so simple, Yeah. but it, but it's such a simple thing results in a much more accessible app. Oh wow. Yeah. Ooh. And I think that's like the key too, is like just running through your app with TalkBack on, because it's mm -hmm. hard to like notice stuff like that unless you've just played around with TalkBack and then as soon as you do you're like whoa that's really awkward I should change that you know so Kelly again uh, awesome community person and talks like everywhere <laughs> and one of the talks that I was really interested in that you did recently and that I think a lot of us have probably had to think about is library dependency management and you do this really great talk so I I'm pretty like simple like you know i I, I manage okay with Gradle, you know, we're not like close friends, but you know, I, I, I like Gradle, Gradle tends to like me. And you know, I, I, all I know about kind of adding my libraries is like, well, I can do compile and then I put like the appropriate, you know, like, you know, group and identifier in there. Well, why isn't, what, in what situations is Gradle, Gradle and me not gonna cut it? So I feel like, you know, using Gradle and like pulling in, like you mentioned, like with just the compile, like version, blah, 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 that's like awesome and like the easiest and the best way to do it when you're pulling in like a third or third party libraries. Mm -hmm. um, those are, when you're writing that in Gradle, what it's doing is that it's going out to JSON Center or Maven Central and like pulling that down for you. So that's awesome. But like sometimes you're in the case where you on your team, you want to create a library that someone might be able to pull down easily on your team or on another team in your company, but you definitely don't want it to be public to you know the world. Yeah. Which yeah. if you put on Maven Central or J Center, it's everyone can grab it. So yeah. like, how, how do you like reconcile that? So right. the one that's closest to that kind of model is um, I talk about it's called uh, you can use Artifactory, which is basically like a privately hosted Maven repository. Oh, cool. Um, so you could also do your own hosting of a Maven repository but like it's just a lot of overhead so people use something like Artifactory which does the hosting for you um, and then you can define your library kind of the same way that you would just like a regular third-party library in your mm -hmm. Gradle file um, and it'll pull it down for you but the thing that's tricky about that is like you know when you pull that library down it's just coming down as like a jar file and so you don't really get easily step into the source code mm -hmm. um, yeah, and if yeah. it's a li if it's an internal library like you might be using it a lot and like changing the code a lot and mm -hmm. that could be come like a huge pain mm -hmm. really fast. So like the other kind of spectrum is the one that's like super unpopular but I really love um, is git submodules. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard anyone say anything particularly good about Git submodules. It so it's like, yeah, we have so to. So sad. <laughs> I, I really like them, and I know it makes me a weirdo, but like, no, that's no, okay. you just <laughs> okay. Tell us. So tell us, like, so you were saying that that, that you like to get submodule because of having access to the source. Exactly. Yeah. So for Git submodule, instead of just pointing to some like random version in the cloud that you pull down. Um, for your um, Maven artifact, you're basically saying like, I have this other repo that's my library repo and, and think in terms of Git and I will point to a specific commit number on in that library and I'll pull that down. Mm -hmm. And so the thing that I love about this is that like Git is like, doesn't lie. Like even though sometimes it feels like it's lying to you, yeah. it doesn't really ever <laughs> lie. Yeah. Um, and so like, you know, if you're pointing to exact commit number, you know you're gonna get that code. Um, and you can pull your whole project down all at the same time. And the best part is that all of the project lives in like a single Android Studio 
like project window. Mm -hmm. um, so it's super easy to see like, oh, this is my library, and then I can jump into that code, and I can go back and forth. Um, so like, depending on the type of library you're building or how often you're changing it, you know, this could be really important. And it, it was like, I really liked working it with that way better because we were doing a lot of stories that had like tons of changes that, or things we needed to create in the library that then were immediately reflected on the UI side. And so we oh, also needed to change it kind of like at the same time. Oh, wow. So okay. it was really good at that point in time in development to like have GitHub modules. And then as we stopped changing the library so much, we ended up moving to Artifactory um, so that we could just, you know, pull down that component mm -hmm. that wasn't being modified as much and we didn't really need that close access to the source code. But that's why I like get some modules because it's easy to just have the code right there um, and it's just it's just nicer, guys. Oh, wow. Give, give some so, modules hey, a chance. Hey, <laughs> so that, that's like a bonus for today. It's like the good side of Git Sub Modules. Yeah. And that's actually like, kind of like the best positive explanation I've ever heard for Git Sub Modules. <laughs> so cool. I will look at them a little bit differently now. Yay. Usually you kind of think of them as like a... Uh, necessary evil, but that actually you make a lot of good. That's so. There, there's a good. There's some good things. There's some really good things about get some modules, guys. Don't Yay. don't like not don't knock them till you try them. Yes. So thank <laughs> you. All right. Well, I I think that's unfortunately I I could talk to Kelly all day because um, she's so <laughs> awesome. But if people wanted to find you on the internet, where can they do that? Yeah. So I'm on Twitter uh, at Kelly Schuster, and I'm on GitHub at Kio Krovovich. And I, I've got a website and blog. It's keodev.com. Thank you so much, Kelly. Yeah, thank you. This is awesome. Oh, it was wonderful having you. And thank you guys so much for joining us. Yep. Bye. Bye.